Is that something else going on? No, I just noticed the machine learning. Was there, so. oh. Well, there's a machine learning assumption. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's. Uh, I think the end of the semester, right? I think everyone is getting ready for the holidays. Turns out, same is true for the faculty. <laughs> anyway, so. with 
x, uh, with 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1, then I just get a linear problem. Okay. And uh, note that that can be solved efficiently. Okay. So that's what we said. And uh, we saw two examples. So in the case of bipartite matching, what I mentioned last time was that replacing these constraints, 0, 1 constraints by inequalities, does not change the polytope. Okay, and uh, this was a non-trivial fact, we didn't prove it, but uh, yeah, so, so you, you, you will be led through the proof in the, in the homework this time, okay, but, uh, but we didn't quite prove this last time. But we said that all the corners of, uh, of this set of constraints, uh, of this polytope rather, are all integer points. And uh, yeah, so that was true for bipartite matching. Then we said that this is not true for all problems. Okay? So we said that for vertex cover, uh, relaxing these zero one constraints can actually create spurious corners. Okay? So, so I just wanted to write down uh, these two things. So, so just for clarity, the original uh, program that you have with 0, 1 constraints. So we will call this the integer linear program. Okay, so this is what is called the ILP. Okay, so we will keep referring to this as the ILP or integer linear program. And the one where you replace these constraints, the relaxation, we will just call the LP or we will call the uh, relaxed LP. And note that this cannot be solved efficiently. This is actually NP hard because vertex cover is NP hard. Okay, so this is NP hard. And this can be solved efficiently. Okay. So both are minimization problems. Now, which minimization problem has a smaller answer? Can, can you compare the answers? to these two programs. Sizes? <coughs> no, the, the objective value. So, so I saw, let's say I could solve this. This is actually anything hard to solve, but let's say I, I could solve this. And uh, that can be solved in polynomial time. For which one will the objective value for the optimum be smaller? The one on the right, right? Because uh, just because it has fewer constraints, so every feasible solution to this is also a feasible solution to this, but potentially not vice versa. Okay. So in particular, what we saw last time was that if you take a solution that's all half, it gets an objective. It satisfies all of those constraints, or all the constraints on the right, and it gets an objective value three by two. Okay, so x, x1 plus x2 plus x3 is 3 by 2, which is 1.5 basically. While the optimum solution for this has value at least 2. Okay. So the value for this is at least 2. Okay, because you've got to pick at least 2 of the x's. Okay, picking just 1 doesn't, doesn't cut it. Okay, so, and this is for this very simple graph, which is just a triangle. Okay, for more complicated graphs, you can have bigger gaps. Okay, so any questions about this? So this is the whole framework of relaxation, and this is, I guess, the picture you should keep in mind. Okay, so there is the integer linear program. It has these constraints, and then there is the relaxed program, which just has uh, like interval constraints. Okay, so x i is in zero. So, as I said before, the, the objective value or the optimum objective value for the one on the right, which is the actual linear program, is smaller than or equal to the optimum objective value for the ILP. And uh, for many problems, this is NP hard to solve while the LP is actually solvable in polytype. Okay. And what we were seeing last time is this general paradigm, which is uh, it's often referred to as relax and round paradigm. Okay. So it's this two-step approach towards obtaining, a, towards solving problems, where you first write an ILP relaxation. First you write down an ILP, 
for your problem. Let's say vertex cover, you can write down something that looks like the object on the left and then you relax it okay, and uh, you solve that linear program you get and now you potentially get a fractional point okay, and then you round this fractional point to an integer solution. Okay, so we'll again see the, see the example that we did last time. Okay, but this is what is called the relax and round paradigm. Okay, so it's uh, good to keep in mind. The name is, if you want to look this up at any point, it's useful. Okay. So, so right, so, so you, come, you, you start with a fractional point and then you round it to an integer point. Okay, and uh, this turns out to be a very powerful way to obtain approximation out. Okay, so this is, yeah. So the optimal solution to the IRT yeah. will also be a solution to the LP rate. Mm -hmm. So in that case, while doing a simplex and we come we come across a fractional point, why not just drop that fractional point and continue the simplex? So oh, we because the simplex down. could stop at the fractional point. Like in this case, uh, the all half solution is the optimum point. Right, but the optimum solution to ILP will also be a corner. Oh, that is not clear. Okay. So it could be an inter interior point for all you know. Okay. Yeah. So this could have a lot more corner points. That's one case, and then it could also have far fewer corner points than the actual ILP. <coughs> okay. So that's a good question. So I, I hope uh, it was clear. So basically, what he asked is, uh, is a corner po is any solution to the ILP also a corner point for this? Okay, for this relaxed linear program, and that is not always true. So, yeah, can't think of an example outright, but uh, it's easy to come. Okay, so this is the paradigm, and uh, so the example we saw last time was for vertex cover. Right, so what, for vertex cover you have these two programs and uh, what you do is you solve the program on the right so that's just a linear program and then you get some fractional solution x and we describe this rounding procedure that starts with any fractional solution x and it comes up with an integer point y okay. and uh, the rounding we saw was very simple we said that uh, uh, you round coordinate by coordinate. Okay, so, so what is x? So x contains x1 through xn, right? Where n is the number of vertices. Okay. And uh, maybe all are half or something like this. Okay, so half and 0 0.1, 0 0.8, some, some numbers like this. This is how x looks like. And we said that starting with this, you produce a y. When the y has a 1, when the x, when the corresponding x is at least half and 0 otherwise. Okay, so you have 1, okay. And we said that the first claim we saw was y is a feasible solution to this, uh, to the program on the left. Okay, so it satisfies all the constraints. And in particular, what did we want to cons uh, what did we want to satisfy? We wanted to say that uh, if i j is an edge, then y i plus y j was at least one. Okay. So we want to prove that if you if you round an x and obtain a y like this, okay, then the y you obtain satisfies this constraint. So do you guys remember why this was true? Like if you started off with an x such that xi plus xj was bigger than or equal to 1 and you did this rounding where everything bigger than or equal to half you made it 1 then we claimed that yi plus yj would be bigger than or equal to 1 So why was this? Could it be that this was satisfied, but after this rounding, this is not? At least one has to be half. At least one by x i and x j. Yeah. So, so
so the argument we saw last time it was very simple so we said that if xi plus xj was bigger than or equal to 1 then at least one should be bigger than or equal to half because they are all non negative and stuff actually it doesn't even matter so at least one has to be bigger than or equal to half right so and that means that that uh, that corresponding y should have been set to 1 and that means that y plus y j is at least one. So it's a very simple argument. So this showed that the y you get from this process is a feasible solution to the ILP. Okay. And then we had to compare the costs. Okay. Uh, so this again was very simple. We said that for any vertex y i is less than or equal to 2 x i. And uh, this was true for a trivial reason because yi was 1 only if xi was at least half and otherwise yi was 0 right? so yi is always less than or equal to 2xi so in particular so that implies uh, that sum of the yi is less than or equal to twice the sum of the xi okay? and then we saw this chain of inequalities okay? so, so sum of the yi is the cost of the solution you, you produced Right? So you produce this solution y, okay? so y is a zero one solution and uh, cost is just this because this was the objective value. Okay? So this is the cost of y and this argument shows that this is less than or equal to twice the cost of x. But x was actually the optimum solution to the linear problem. Okay? So cost of x is actually equal to the cost uh, to the optimum of the linear program. So this is equal to twice this and the optimum of the linear program is always smaller than or equal to the oct of the IL. So, so what this shows is that the y you produce, so the corollary of this is that the cost of the y we produced is smaller than or equal to 2 times the optimum for any feasible solution. Okay. So and this basically means that this is a 2 approximation algorithm. Okay. So this is the definition of a 2 approximation algorithm. So the solution you produce has a cost that is two, at most 2 times the optimum. <coughs> And if you think about it, this is a very a different way of proving the, an approximation guarantee. Right? So if you remember, we did stuff like this for a bunch of problems. Like uh, where we said, okay, if local search stops, then the solution you have is a two approximation. And stuff like this. Right? So we proved things like this. Okay? But this is actually a very different way to prove it. Okay? So earlier we used to say, okay, so take an optimal solution and you found some way of comparing yourself with the optimum okay. and those arguments were usually you know somewhat ad hoc they need some clever insight okay. so for instance in your homeworks you did this matching example where you said okay if this local search stopped then uh, then you had to write down some inequalities and then you prove that what you get is actually fairly good okay. but these kind of things are tricky right but he, he, this is a very systematic and easy way of doing things okay. and uh, it turns out for many problems you can actually come up with algorithms of this form I mean here also it's not always easy you have to often how you round is the tricky step okay. so this example the rounding was very easy right so rounding is uh, yeah basically you want to go from a fractional x to an integer y right so in this case the rounding was very easy. Sometimes you might have to do much more work to go from a fractional point to an integer point. Okay. But uh, very often it is it is possible and it yields some very good algorithm. Okay, so we'll. Uh, I was hoping to do another example, but we we don't have time. So let's uh, let's see another simple example in the homework, which uh, which will illustrate things better. Okay, so so basically rounding is the key step. Sometimes okay, so 
showing that after you round, all the constraints are satisfied could actually be tricky. Alright, so let me not uh, dwell more on this. I wanted to talk about something else. Okay, so any questions about the general relax and round paradigm? is this question of infeasibility. Okay? So, so the question you want to answer is, so, so far we, we said that the feasible set is just a convex set. Right? And we were implicitly assuming that the, that the set is non-empty. Right? Because we were trying to maximize some linear function over it. So, so what could happen is that sometimes a set of linear in, uh, inequalities might actually be uh, might have no feasible solution. Okay, so let's see some examples. Okay, so suppose you let's start off with an easier example where you have a bunch of linear equalities. Okay? So these are just you know linear constraints, right? So this uh, an example could be uh, yeah. So you could have oh maybe I give an example in two D first. Okay, so you have two variables x and y. And now you could have constraints like x plus 2y equals 3, x plus y equals 2, <coughs> and x equals 2. Okay. So, is this set of uh, equalities feasible? Why not? Because x <coughs> has to be 2. Means y should be zero. Yeah. But which contradicts the first. Right. So so you can work this out. So you can uh, say that okay, if x is two, then y has to be zero, and this is easy to substitute and check. Right. So and you can also draw these kind of things in two D. Right. So you could say that uh, x plus two y equals three. So, I don't know how exactly they will look like, but they will basically be three lines that uh, two of them will intersect at different points. Okay, so it's probably wrong, but this is how it looks like. Okay, so alright, so, so this is a very simple example in 2D, right? So, you can often just plug in and verify. So, what we want to come up with is a general theory of when these kind of, uh, I mean, how you can prove that a set of linear equalities is not feasible. So, okay. So let's uh, let's look at another example. Okay. So in this case, you could argue, okay, I had more equations than variables, so it was unlikely that you know it was feasible. Right. So, so now let's look at this. You have three equations and three variables. So, would you say that this is feasible? Yeah. Why? Say for logic, if x1 is 2, then by the top of them. Oh, okay, so, so this is actually easier than I thought. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> alright, so, so that's fine. I mean, uh, so this would imply that. Uh, x2 plus x3 is 0 and this would imply that x2 plus x3 is 1. Right? So another way of saying this is uh, you can, in essence what you are doing is you are, uh, so let's say I can view this as adding and subtracting e oh, these equations. Right? So let's call this equation 1, let's call this equation 2 and this is equation 3. Now, what I'm essentially doing is, if I do equation 1 minus equation 2 minus equation 3, suppose I do this, right? So, what's the left hand side? 
Yeah, so the left hand side is 0 because uh, it's both, I mean, the x1 plus x2 plus x3 cancels out. Okay, so the left hand side is 0, while the right hand side is something, right? So it's minus 1. <coughs> so it's, uh, so you could say that this is another way of proving that this set of equations is not feasible, right? Because you add the last two equations and subtract the sum from this, okay. then uh, then you get zero on the left and one on the right. Okay. So you've proved that zero equals minus one, which is which is false. Okay. So 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 this is another way of arguing. Okay. So yeah. If you're going to use that method, do you have to have all your variables on one side and constants on the other, or does it matter? No, you can, uh, yeah, th that's one way of thinking about it, but uh, you can always place things that way, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, constants are just constants, so you just add them up and you keep them on one side, and the variables you keep it on that. So, but it doesn't matter, I mean, even if, uh, even if some variables on the left, if you could really make it zero, then it's fine. So, so is this procedure clear? So what we are doing is, you are, in some sense, you are finding coefficients for these equations and then adding them up, right? So we are trying to do essentially something of the kind where you do uh, some constant C1 times equation 1 plus C2 times equation 2 plus C3 times equation 3. Then it so turns out that the right hand sides add up to something uh, which is non zero and the left hand side is zero. Okay. I guess what you are asking is not uh, is it if I could show x1 equals zero then it's not good enough because that could be feasible. Is that what you are asking? Sort of, yeah. Yeah, so okay. So so that's a good point. So so there uh, so this is not good enough to prove that this set of equations is not infeasible. Right? Because you could set x1 equals 0. Okay? So it's the constant part that has to work out to non-zero. And the variables part should exactly cancel everything out. Okay? So the variables part should just be equal to 0. Okay? So that's important. So is this point clear? So basically showing that you can, I don't know if you can do this for this set of equations, but potentially, uh, you could have something non-zero on the left which involves the x's and uh, something which is zero on the right. Yeah, but that's not good enough because you could set this expression to be equal to zero. Right? So if you think about it, right? so, so, so what we want is, we want the, the variables part to become equal to zero, identically equal to zero. and. Uh, <coughs> the coefficients part, or the constraint part to be not non zero yeah but if the equations are balanced even if you put some variables on the other side they won't be zero to zero but they'll be constant to constant as well can you say say it again uh, say in this equation x1 equal to 2 yeah if, if you move uh, on the top equation and uh, say uh, x1 to the other side Mm -hmm. Say so it won't be at that, it might not be 0 equal to 0, it might be equal to 2 equal to 2, which should also be same because. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. So, so I think this is, uh, I guess you intuitively all see the picture, right? So you should not be able to prove that 0 equals some constant. Okay. So that's, uh, if, it's, if you can show it, then it means that this system is infeasible. Okay. And this you can do in general. Right, so you can say I have some a1 transpose x. So a1 is a vector. Okay, x is let's say an n-dimensional vector to x n, and uh, a1 think of it as some constant a11, a12, a1 n, okay. and a1 transpose x is just a11 x1 plus a. So this is just a general linear system with m constraints and any uh, sorry and n variables. Now here also you could ask the same thing, right? So you could say suppose I could 
So suppose I could manipulate these equations. So suppose I find some y1 times the first equation plus y2 times the second and so on and ym times the last then I add them up and I get 0 equals some constant. Then, then it means that this set of equations is not feasible. Okay. So, is this point clear? Alright. So, the, it turns out that the very nice thing, or the, I mean, a really powerful statement, is that this is the only way in which you can uh, have a system of infeasible equations. Okay. So, in particular, if you have any set of equations that is not feasible. Okay, so if I have uh, some set of equations like this which is not feasible, then you can always find constants yi's such that if you multiply equation 1 with y1, equation 2 with y2 and add up, then the left hand side exactly works out to 0, the right hand side it works out to something non-zero. Okay. So infeasibility is equivalent to this kind of state. So, so let, let, let me go, go here, okay, so this is, this is actually a very, uh, it's, it's, it's a general theory, so this is called Hilbert's uh, Milstein Satz, okay, so what it says is, so it's not just true for linear equations, okay? so this is also true for polynomials, okay, so if you have arbitrary polynomials P1 through Pm, okay, so think of a polynomial as, you know, x1, x2, x3, plus x3 squared minus 4 or something like this, right? So p1 could be something like this. p2 is something else and so forth. And you have equalities like p1 of x equals 0, p2 of x equals 0 and so on. So it turns out that this system of polynomial equations, okay, so let me write this down, the system of equations is infeasible if and only if there exist polynomials qi q1 through qn such that is identically a constant. Okay. So, so I just wrote this down, now let's uh, ex explain what it means. So it basically says, uh, note that here the right hand sides are all zero. Right? So I'm assuming that uh, your p1, so in the view before, so think of x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus 2 as being your polynomial. Okay. And the second polynomial is x2 plus x3 minus 1. And so, on. so, so what this says is, you can actually, so in, in the general case, it's not constants q1 through qm, even these are polynomials, okay. and uh, so if you can find polynomials q1 through qm uh, that are not, yeah, I guess they clearly cannot be all zero. So if you find such polynomials, such that p1 q1 plus so on up to pm qm is one, okay, then uh, this set of equations is, is infeasible and this is an if and only if. Okay. So, uh, in the sense that if, if this system is infeasible then there exists such qi's and vice versa. Okay. So usually in these things, one side of this implication is easy. Okay. Which is, uh, if there exist q's like this, then this system is infeasible. So why is that? Do you guys all see that part? So this is exactly like what we said before, right? So if there exist multipliers y1 through yn, such that these things add up to 0 equals something, right? Then it's clear that these are all infeasible, right? Because if they were feasible, then you would get a contradiction. Okay, so, and 
Yeah, so, so if you don't follow this, you can think about this for a bit. It's not that crucial to us at this point. So, so I'll just show the linear version uh, in more detail. Okay. So for, for linear systems, this is actually much easier. Okay, so what you can show is, let me write this down. So if you have, so I wanted to at least give you a sense of the general theory and I wanted to explain in detail the linear stuff. Okay, so if you don't understand the general one, don't worry about it. So it's a linear thing that we'll focus on. So if you have linear equations A1 transpose X equals B1, A2 transpose X equals B2 and so on to AM X equals BM. Okay. The system is infeasible if and only if there exist constants y i y n such that y1 times a1 transpose x plus This is identically zero and y1 b1 plus y2 plus y n b n equals one. So I could have written is non-zero, but I just wrote equals one because I can always scale things so that it's equal to one. I can always rescale the y's so that it's equal to one. So is the statement of this theorem clear? So it's saying that if I have any system of linear equations like this, that looks like this, you have m equations in n variables, and suppose it's infeasible, okay, then there exist constants like this, okay, the constants such that y1 times a1 transpose x, if you add up the equations, you get identically zero, which means all the coefficients of all the xi's are zero. Okay, so that's what that's what it means when I write identically zero, and the right hand side should be equal to one. Okay. And uh, some of you may be put off by the algebra, so I'll wait for a bit and <coughs> wait for you to ask questions. So, so what I'm saying is is basically an extension of the example that I gave. It's just uh, written out explicitly. <laughs> Uh, the, the interesting thing is, 
why should it be that uh, whenever it's invisible, you can always find constants like this? So, does everyone kind of see what's going on? Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, I'll try to give an idea of the proof, but let's, but first, I think the important thing here is the statement. Okay, that, uh, Alright, so before we try to prove this, so let me say one thing. Okay, so okay, so, so this is a very good characterization. Right? So what this says is, uh, infeasibility of a system is basically equivalent to finding y's that satisfy this. Okay? So now the question I want to ask is, can I cast the problem of finding infeasibility as yeah, you know, as some kind of linear systems themselves, right? Because this is just a system of linear equations itself, right? Because you want to find, you want to make all the coefficients of the xi zero, and you want to find this, make the right hand side equals one, right? So, yes. Yeah, so, so let's see. L let me write this out so that this becomes clear. Okay. So suppose I have. Uh, let me take the some example. Okay, so I'm just going to take some example. So I write x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 equals a x x2 plus x3 equals b x2 plus x3 equals c. Okay. And suppose I wanted to prove to you that this was infeasible. Okay, so A, B, C is some constant which I haven't specified. Right? So, what did we say? We said that this is infeasible if and only if there exists Yi okay, such that if you multiply this by Y1, this by Y2, this by Y3, you get 0 equals 1. Right? So, so what does that mean? Right? So, so the co what's the coefficient of x1 when you uh, when you multiply these equations and add? Yeah. So the coefficient of x1 is x1 is there only here and here. Okay. So here the coefficient is zero. So it's just uh, y1 plus y3. Coefficient of x2. What is coefficient of x2? Two y1 plus y2 plus y3. Okay. And coefficient x3 is basically y1. So, if I've got to show that, uh, if I want to get, uh, deduce 0 equals 1 from this, right? So, so what should each of these coefficients be? Right? So, so, they should all be 0, right? Because otherwise there's no way you can deduce uh, this. Okay. So, so, you better have this to be equal to 0, this to be equal to 0, this to be equal to 0. And what is the right hand side? If I do this. So the coefficients on the left are this, and the right hand side is basically this, right? And this I want to be equal to 1. Okay. So what we've, uh, so what the previous theorem says is that if this feasible, so let's, uh, the important thing to notice here is that this is also a linear system, right? This is again a linear system. So I, ha I started off with linear system 1 and I produced this linear system 2. And what I said was that the previous theorem basically says that LS1 is infeasible if and only if LS2 is feasible. 
Okay. Basically, LS2 is feasible basically means that exist wise such that all those constraints are satisfied. Right? That's equivalent and that uh, from the previous theorem is bas uh, basically means that uh, you could find multipliers so that you know you, you can prove 0 equals 1. Right? So, so that's the very kind of a very beautiful thing that you get out of it. It is that if you have a linear system, you can come up with a new linear system such that this is feasible if and only if the other guy is infeasible. Okay? And uh, this other linear system is usually called the dual of the first one. Okay? So in a sense, the feasibility of these two are always the opposite of each other. So this is a very nice notion. Okay? And for linear systems, this actually turns out to be pretty simple to prove, which we will just see to prove. Uh, but the cool thing is that you can also prove such a thing for inequalities. Okay, so that's what we'll come to in a bit. But first, any questions about this? So I think the interesting thing here is what you write down is also a linear system. Right? So that's what's very nice about this. That uh, you had one linear system, you came up with the other. And this is feasible if and only if the other guy is infeasible. Okay, so questions about this? Alright, so if there's no questions then let's... Uh, yeah, so, so let me try to give a sense of the proof. Okay, so so how would you go about proving such a thing? Right? So we want to show that this system of equations is infeasible if and only if there exist y's like this. And we said one side is easy. Right? So said that there exist y's implies system is infeasible. So this part is easy. So we need to show that infeasible implies there exist wise. Right? So if and only if basically means you have to show both directions. Okay? And uh, this side is easy and this is the part that we need to show. So how could we go about showing this? Okay, so how do you guys think? Uh, so, so what you're saying is, uh, in some sense, if the system is infeasible, then you have to find multipliers like this, right? So it's a yeah. In some sense, you've got to construct these y's, and uh, from the knowledge that there is no solution like this. Okay, so this is, if you think about it, this is actually tricky. Okay, so. Like uh, yesterday, I was when I was making these uh, slides, I tried to come up with it. it took me like a few minutes to uh, remember how it was proved. Right? Like it's hard to come up with this from scratch. So that's why this is a non-trivial theorem. Okay. So so the proof is actually very elegant. Okay. So so let me let let's see. Okay. So I'm going to show it only for an example. Okay. So the general proof is roughly along the same lines. So, so let's see a simple proof. So we have this uh, equation like this. Right? So you have x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 equals
there is no choice of x1, x2, x3 such that this is true. Right? So, so let me. So, so the trick, as I said, is to view it in the following way. So suppose I look now at these column vectors. Okay. So, so these are just three vectors and they are in three-dimensional space, right? They are just three-dimensional vectors. Okay. Now, when can you say that uh, there is no solution like this? Can you now think of some geometric property of these three vectors that will let you say that this set of, uh, uh, that these equations are not true? I mean, yeah, this set of equations are in three. Well, uh, yeah, if they are orthogonal, then it's actually very nice, right? So then it means that you can cover the whole space <coughs> using these things. Okay? And that is fine. I mean, in that case, you can, uh, you can, yeah. So, so I want you to think of, the, of this as, as follows. Okay? So, so let me call this vector uh, u, this vector v, this vector w. Okay? And this also, I'm going to treat this as a three-dimensional vector, a, b, c. I'm going to call this, uh, let's say, Z. So now I can write this in vector form as U times X1 plus V times X2 plus W times X3 equals Z. Right? I just wrote down the system in vector form. Okay? So, so far it's all clear, right? Okay, so now the point is, so, so what is the left hand side, right? So if I give you any set, any x1, x2 and x3, this is just some linear combination of the vectors u, v and w, right? Because if I said x1 equals let's say 1, x2 equals 2, x3 equals 1, then this is just 1 times the first vector plus 2 times the second vector and so on. So, so if I look at the set of all such left hand side vectors, okay, so the set of all ux1 plus vx2 plus wx3 <coughs> such that, uh, I mean, I vary x1, x2, x3, okay, and then I see what space I get. Okay, so, so I, let's consider all possible x1, x2, x3 in real numbers and I look at this, right? So, I, so it's that x1, x2, x3 is in, is are real numbers. Okay. So, let, let's call this set x. Okay. For every choice of x1, x2, x3, this is just one vector. So, do you guys know what this is called? I, I, I'm sure all of you know what it's called. So, it's, uh, if I had only one vector, then the set of all scalar multiples of it, it's just a subspace, right? And now I have, uh, I have the span of u, v, and w. Okay, so the word is, in linear algebra, you call this the span of three vectors. Okay, so the span of vectors is basically all possible linear combinations of these vectors. Okay, so you have, uh, I have these vectors u, v, and w, and this set S is just the span of u, v, w. So, so the infeasibility of this basically means that the point z does not lie in the span, right? So, it's just an extremely simple uh, formulation of this, right? Alternate way of looking at this. Right? So, it just means, uh, so the system is infeasible. Implies z is not in the span of u, v, w. Okay, well, u is this 1, 0, 1. 
and uh, yeah, so so in general, you have some vectors like this, and you have some right-hand side. And basically, you will say that uh, this system is infeasible if and only if the right vector is not in the span of this. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, how does this imply what we want? Okay. So, so far, we haven't seen why this implies what we want. Okay. So, but is this notion clear? That uh, that you look at these column vectors <coughs> and. Uh, this system is infeasible if and only if the coefficient vector, which is that ABC vector, is not in the span of these guys. All right. So, so now let's go back to the geometric picture. Okay. So, so how does this span of a bunch of vectors look like? So, let's say I have uh, two vectors in a plane. Right. So, what's the span of these two vectors? Suppose they are not along the same direction. It's the full plane. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so it's the entire plane that covers this. Okay. Because any point like this point could be written as some per, some number times the first vector plus some other number times the second vector. Right. So. So it's the entire plane that's uh, spanned by these vectors. Okay. So now let's draw a slightly fancier high-dimensional picture. So in general, a plane. Uh, so so you have. Oh, let me see if I can erase this.
So I, I have a plane, think of a two-dimensional plane, and I have this point that's outside this plane. Right? What I want you to find is uh, some direction <coughs> which is orthogonal to this plane, but it has a non-zero component along this, uh, along, along the z. So any guesses? What would be a... I guess this picture should... Normal. The normal, right? So that's... The, the, that's the natural idea, right? So the normal to this would satisfy all these constraints. Okay? And the normal is zero basically means z is in the plane, in which case you can you can't find such a thing. Okay? But uh, otherwise you can always do this. Okay, so in fact I can make this always equal to one. Okay. So this theorem is intuitively clear uh, for 2D and stuff, but uh, in general, uh, so this is called uh, yeah, so this is true for much more general spaces called Hilbert spaces, and this is called the, the Han Banach theorem. So some of you may have seen this. Okay, so I just want to say they are the same thing. So for those of you who have seen this, okay. So yeah, but this is geometrically pretty clear, right? So if you take the normal, then uh, it will have some. If z is not in the plane, this inner product has to be non-zero. By scaling you can make it equal to 1. And uh, everything else, because it's normal, it's actually, uh, this direction is orthogonal to S. Okay. And uh, so, now I won't get into this, but uh, you can now go back and figure out that Y is exactly the, Y's are exactly the multipliers you need. Okay. So now if we go back, so what have we found, right? So we found some y such that y is orthogonal to the span of all these guys. Okay? And but y has an inner product of one with the right hand side. Okay? And what that basically means is the span contains u, v, and w. Okay? So y's inner product with u, v, and w should all be zero. And you can work out that those are the coefficients of x1, x2, and x3 respectively. Okay, and uh, so that's why uh, the y's are basically the multipliers. Okay, so this is an easy exercise. For them. Actually, maybe all of you just see it by the description. Do, do all of you see what, what I just said? Basically, I was saying that if I take y1 times the first equation, y2 times the second equation, y3 times the third equation, and add them up, then the coefficient of x1 is basically the inner product of y with u, which we know is 0 because y is actually orthogonal to the whole span of u, v, and w. Okay. So, so this implies that inner product of y with u equals actually this part implies that And these are basically the coefficients when you add up. Okay? So that's why you get 0 equals essentially the inner product of y with 0 is 1. So, so this is basically the proof. So, and you can, I've proved this for an example, but you can, I guess you can all see that this generalizes to high dimensions. Alright, so, so this was for equalities, okay, so all this theory is for equalities and just to remember, this was the final theorem, right, so we said that you have some system, you could write down this other system such that linear system 1 is infeasible if and only if linear system 2 is feasible, okay, so this was the conclusion. Now what we want to do is something similar for inequalities. Okay, so so suppose you have a bunch of uh, two systems like this. Okay. So is either of these feasible or infeasible? What about the first one? Is this feasible? Actually, uh, before we go to this, uh, any questions about the previous thing? Is the theorem clear to everyone? Because it's 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 very cool and I don't want you to miss it. <laughs> so if 
if you have questions, feel free to come by afterwards. Okay. All right. So the other, uh, the next thing is, uh, yeah, let's go to inequalities. And we want to come up with a very similar sounding, similar looking theory for this. So, so suppose you have linear equalities like this. Is this set of equalities feasible? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So, th so this turns out to be feasible. And what about this? So this is feasible and you can witness it by some x, y, z, uh, some x1, x2, x3, right? So you can say, uh, sorry? Second one is not. Uh, yeah, so, so this you can say, okay, x2 equals x3 equals 1, and x1 equals oh, okay, 1 also. Okay, so all of them being 1 is a feasible solution. This one is not, okay, so that's more interesting. This is not feasible. Why is this not feasible? Yeah, so you can add the last two inequalities, okay, and uh, so suppose you add this and this, then I get x1 plus x2 plus x3, bigger than or equal to 1, okay, and, uh, and the first, sorry, bigger than or equal to 3, and the first inequality says x1 plus x2 plus x3 is smaller than or equal to 2, okay, so, so you can't have something that's bigger than 3 and smaller than 2. Right, so, okay, so is this clear why the system is infeasible? Note that you can't do the same thing here. So you can't add these two inequalities. Right, so everybody clear on this? Because one is a less than or equal to and the other is a bigger than or equal to. So you can't add these. But yeah. you can multiply them by negative one. Right, so you can, uh, you can, to add these, what you'll have to do is to say that uh, replace this by uh, 1 smaller than, uh, actually, yeah, whatever. Right? So you can do minus x2 minus x3 less than or equal to minus 1, and now you can add. But then you don't get a contradiction to this one. So, right, so to, to be precise, you can write everything as smaller than or equal to and then you can try to add these things. Okay. So, so another way of seeing this is to say that I can write all the inequalities as smaller than or equal to 1. Right? Like this one, I could write it as exactly what he said. You could write it as <coughs> minus x2 minus x3 smaller than or equal to minus 1. And this one, I could write this as minus x1 smaller than or equal to minus 2. Okay. And now I could say add all the three inequalities I get, I have. Okay, so I could add this is equation 1, this is equation 2, this is equation 3. And now I basically get uh, on the left side I get 0 and uh, I get less than or equal to minus 1. Right? So, does everyone see this? So basically I rewrote the second equation as x2 plus x3 is, sorry, minus x2 minus x3 less than or equal to minus 1. Okay. And minus x1 less than or equal to minus 2. And now I add this and this. Okay. All the xi's cancel out. And, I, and the left side is 0 for that reason. So the right side is minus 1. So, so what you could say is what if you if you get in, if you are inspired by the previous uh, what we saw for equalities, right? So what you could say is okay, maybe the following is true, right? So maybe if I have to show that uh, some a one one x one plus a one two x two, if I have a general system like this, a one n x n, that's going to be one. A M one X one A M N X N. That's going to be M. So these are M 
everything is less than or equal to, let's say, so that we don't have to do this negation. Okay, so every constraint, you can always write it so that it's less than or equal to. And you have numbers on the right and variables on the left. Okay, so you can just write your system in this form. And now you could say, I multiply this by some non-negative number. Okay. I'm only allowed to multiply this by non-negative number. Right? So I could say, could say y1 here, y2 here, and ym here. And you could say, suppose, I can infer 0 less than or equal to minus 1 by, by picking appropriate y right. Okay, and y i should all be bigger than or equal to 0. So, so why should all y i's be bigger than or equal to 0? Yeah, otherwise the inequality direction will change. Okay, so if uh, yi is minus 1 or something, the direction would change and then you can no longer add them up. Okay. So I've got to pick yi is equal to 0, uh, bigger than or equal to 0, and uh, I add them up. If I can infer 0 less than or equal to minus 1, then it's clear that this set of, this system is not feasible. Right? This is similar to, to before, because uh, like then it's basically like saying, you can't have all these constraints being satisfied. If they were, you would get a contradiction. Okay. Uh, but here also it turns out, this kind of a very nice duality statement is true. Okay, so here also it turns out that theorem, which we will see next time, okay, so we won't, prove, we won't quite prove this, is uh, system of inequalities is infeasible linear inequalities if and only if there exist yi's that allow you to infer 0 less than equal to minus 1 and it turns out this again, like we did for linear equalities, you can write down what it means for you to infer 0 less than equal to minus 1. Right? What it means is there exist yi's which are, non which are bigger than or equal to 0 such that the sum of the coefficients adds, uh, sorry, some y1, a11 plus this is equal to 0 for all, yeah, so, so let me just write it down so that because I have a couple of minutes. Here again you could say, try to find y's, okay. try to find y's such that, firstly you need y i bigger than or equal to 0 and how do you write this, how do you write this thing that uh, you infer 0 less than or equal to one, minus 1. So what I'm asking is, uh, suppose I wanted to say, suppose I wanted to ask, do there exist y's like this, right, that allow you to infer 0 less than equal to minus 1. So what all conditions should such y's satisfy? Same condition as the previous. 
It's very similar, yeah. So, so what you can... What you've got to have is the coefficient of all the xi's has to be equal to zero. Okay. Because otherwise you can't... Uh, I mean, otherwise you cannot conclude that zero is less than equal to minus one. And otherwise you have some coefficient <coughs> for the x's. Okay. So you've got to have... Uh, for all i, you must... For all j, let's say. That is, for coefficient of xj is zero. xj in the sum of the inequalities. So this is uh, y1 in equation 1 plus so on. And this is the sum of these inequalities. Is zero. Okay, and the coefficient, if you work it out, would be equal to something like y1 xj or maybe x1j sorry, a1j a2j equals 0 for all j okay. so this looks messy but it's easy okay so if you work it out for a specific example this will actually be pretty easy. Okay. And uh, yes, yeah, so, so this has to be 0 for every j. And the right hand side must be less than minus 1. Right? So then you get uh, y1 b1 plus y2 b2 less than equal to minus 1. Okay. So you can also say it's equal to minus 1. Right? So this is what you get when you multiply the first equation by y1, second equation by y2 and add up. And none of the y's can be zero, right? Uh, yeah, that I already said. I said all the yi's have to be bigger than or equal to zero. You won't set them to be equal to zero because then uh, all, if they're all equal to zero, this last constraint cannot be satisfied. Okay. So, so you have the same kind of situation that this new set of linear inequalities so this is another linear program, right? So this new set of linear inequalities is feasible if and only if the previous guy is not feasible. Okay. And this is what's called the dual and we'll get to this next time.